okay java keywords so this table uh, on the current slide it actually lists out all the keywords which we have in java out there okay so if you have a look at it, it's got uh, a total of 49 keywords and this is as for the jdk 1.4.2 version so i think the latest version has got probably one or two keywords added to this list okay so what is the keyword in java so a keyword is nothing but it's a word which has got some kind of special significance to the java compiler right so whenever you the compiler comes across any of these words in the java program it knows that it has to deal with it in a special way right? it's not just a simple word so basically you will not you cannot use any of these keywords in your program in any other way right and only in the way in which it's actually supposed to be used to right? and each of these keywords given out here each one of them has got some kind of significance uh, in the java programming language okay so we've actually seen uh, some of the keywords already in our earlier examples right? like we've seen what a class is we've seen new we've talked about package we've talked about public so some of the keywords we've actually already discussed and we know how to use it and where to use it and why to use it right and uh, in the future slides till the end of by by the time we complete this uh, whole tutorial we will actually be using and talking about all the keywords which are out there so by the end of the session you will actually know what each keyword is what's the significance of each of the keyword out there and where to use it and how do you use it why do you use it right okay uh, we have uh, discussed quite a bit about the classes and objects and instances in our previous slide so here we are actually going to take a, a closer look at that and we are going to see how your data is uh, managed in the java world so here we will also be discussing about the difference between stack and heap. So what is a stack and what is a heap? They are nothing but data structures in Java. So whatever data is stored in Java, it either resides on the stack or on the heap. So we will now discuss here uh, what resides on the stack and what resides on the heap. Okay. So let's start off with a simple example. Let's say you've got a class in which you've got a main method. The main method calls method 1 and the method 1 calls method 2. Now let's say that method 2 has got some local variables that is declared within the method. So say I've got an integer x whose value is 10 and also I have a reference variable y which actually refers to the instance a. Okay. So if you see here, this local variables are being defined in the stack. right? So all your local method variables will reside on the stack. Okay. So what resides on the heap? on the heap all your instance variables and whatever objects you create resides on the heap so one rule of thumb you can say is that whenever you use the keyword new you are bound to create a new object on the heap right so when i say the object is stored on the heap what exactly is stored on the heap as you see the stack stores the local variables so similarly, the heap will actually store the instance variables of the class. Now say for example, A has got three instance variables, that is x, y, and z. Okay. So the values of x, y, and z is what is going to be stored on the heap. Okay. So that is nothing but it defines the state of the instance or state of the object. So let's say x is 1, y is 2, and z is 3. So these values are actually being stored on the heap. Okay, so that's it. The heap actually stores your objects and instance variables, whereas your stack stores all your local variables. Okay, the stack also stores the execution state of the methods. Now uh, we know that method two is called, and method two has got some uh, operations and uh, some statements out there, right? Which it has to execute so once all the methods from method 2 are executed it actually pops out the method 2 out of the stack so stack is as the name suggests it's nothing but uh, uh, last in first out uh, data structure right so whatever comes in last goes out first so when once method 2 completes its execution uh, 
uh, it simply pops out method two out of the stack and it also clears off all these local variables it's no more accessible since method two is out of the stack now and similarly in the end uh, after popping out everything the main method is also popped out of the stack and the stack is now clear again ready to be used right so in this manner the memory is actually allocated and deallocated when it comes to a stack and uh, how is memory managed in a heap creation of objects is up to you right you, you just say new and a new object is created on the heap but how do you deallocate the memory that is up to the garbage collector it's not up to you so that is completely a different topic which we will be discussing later in the session right so i hope uh, the difference between stack and heap and when do you stack not when you use basically what is stored on stack and what is stored on heap is a bit clear to you right uh, so we now know that uh, java is an object oriented programming language right and it complies to all the object oriented programming concepts so let's see what those concepts are what are the object oriented concepts all about so this slide actually lists out some of the basic uh, oops concepts which we have that right? the first of things class and object uh, there is something which we have been discussing about a lot uh, till now so i want to uh, put a lot of focus on uh, these two things you already know what a class is and what an object is right coming to abstraction what is abstraction abstraction is nothing but hiding certain details and show only the essential details right? so basically when you uh, have a look in the future slides when we talk about uh, modifiers and we see uh, how you apply the ab abstract modifier to the classes and methods you will actually see uh, what it really means and how you actually uh, employ this abstraction feature so say for in in a class say you, uh, implementing everything doesn't really make really sense to you, to you right if in a, a particular class you can just hide certain details and only the essential details you can implement right so that nothing but abstraction encapsulation encapsulation is binding data and methods together so basically the uh, end product uh, of encapsulation would be data hiding so as you implement the encapsulation you actually end up employing the data hiding functionality so say for example uh, you have an employee class in which you have the salary as an instance variable okay. and you've got a set salary method so and uh, i don't want uh, anybody to uh, uh, come in and set the salary for an employee right i don't want anybody to have access to that to be able to set a salary uh, to any person out there so there uh, i will uh, make use of encapsulation to secure that thing so that nobody will be able to set make changes to my salary and only certain authorized people can make changes to the salary okay that's encapsulation all about inheritance inheriting the features of a superclass right so let's say that uh, car is a class okay and uh, say for example nissan is a type of car right so it is actually a subclass of car so nissan is now actually going to inherit certain features of the car so we all know that in general a car has got like it's got a four tires it's got a steering wheel it's got seats like things like that so all these features a nissan basically implements from a car right so it actually inherits these features from a car so that's what inheritance about you can inherit the features of a super class and polymorphism having one name with many forms right so let's take an example of uh, a class called shape okay so it actually a shape is nothing but it can it can be of any shape right and there are actually different classes which subclass out of the shape class so there could be a triangle it could be a circle it could be a rectangle or one of the many other shapes which we have right and say we have got a method called area okay so now e in each of these classes the implementation of the method area is 
completely different right because if you want the area of a square you just say side into side and if you want the area of a rectangle you say length into breadth right so implementation of that particular method area is different in each of these classes so that's what polymorphism talks about having one name but many forms right so i hope it's at least a bit clear now like what are the different object oriented concepts and what they are but uh, we will definitely be reviewing these object oriented concepts uh, in the future slides and we will actually see examples of each of these uh, concepts in the future slides of this tutorial all right okay now data types so what is a data type so data type is nothing but you assign a type to a given literal in your java program so you can have different numbers in java program right you can have 10 11 12 say for example in a student table or in a student class a roll number right it represents a number generally so roll number 1 so if there are 10 students in the class you will have roll number 1 2 3 4 5 6 up to 10 right and it's stored as a number and the next thing you have in a student table is a name student name right and it's not a number anymore now it's a string right a set of characters and say for example one more thing you have in the student table is gender say for example and it is either m or f so m stands for male and f stands for female so that's a single character right so you've got these different types of data which you would like to store in your class right and all these types are not the same they're different right so for so in the similar manner you've got different data types in java which can store these different types of data to you in your program so we've got all these list of data types uh, which are listed out here and uh, i've also listed the number of bytes it stores and the minimum value maximum value and the literal values which it can accept so if you say for example look at the byte data type it's got only it stores one byte right that means 8 bits so the number of bytes as the number of bytes increases the amount of data you can store is will also increase right obviously so the larger the data the bigger the data type you would require but most of the time if you are dealing with numbers in java you use integer data types okay and if you've got a very long number you use long and when you have decimals you use float most of the times okay so the general rule to the min value and max value are is this min value is to the power of bits minus 1 number of bits minus 1 and max value is to the power of number of bits minus 1 minus 1 right but uh, there are certain exceptions definitely to this general rule so say for example a char data type is an exception it really doesn't have negative values okay and uh, the maximum value is to the power of 16 minus 1 so basically the number of bits would be 16 right so it's to the power of n Minus one to the power number of bits minus one, and uh, float and double basically doesn't have any min value max value. Same case with boolean; it's got only two values, either a true or false. Okay. So this is about uh, the data types. Actually, when we implement uh, all these different data types in the demo session and see how uh, we can actually convert one data type to another. and how actually some of the data types actually implicitly converts uh, to other data types uh, so uh, when we do the demo things will be more clearer 